a show about tabletop gaming from stand-up comedians. Let's hear it for Javier Palenzuela. <laughs> this next gentleman, he's cute, he's got a ponytail. Give it up for one hot hair farmer. Let's hear it for Ed <laughs> Shannon. Welcome back to the Gamers of Comedy Show. I'm Javier Ponzuela, and I'm here with the uh, creators and originators of the upcoming second annual Ethercon RPG online convention. Did I say that right? That's actually Aethercon. Uh, Aethercon. Hmm. Okay, the Aethercon <laughs> convention. <laughs> Canadian. Well, uh, please introduce yourselves. My name is Stephen J. Holodinsky. I'm the event coordinator. I'm Curtis Baum. I'm the vendor hall liaison. And I'm Mark Carroll. I'm the Bell and Scroll liaison, which means I'm the guy that talks to various blogs and podcasts and such. And I'm also the Call of Shibu uh, event coordinator. Mark also has a, a further portfolio, as we did without portfolio. <laughs> we just kind of throw things at him. Here, do this. <laughs> So. I don't want to deal with this, Mark. Your turn. Yeah. Okay. It picks up the pieces. Yeah. So um, it's November 15th, right? And 15th, 16th, and 17th. And it, it utilizes some new technology when it comes to online tabletop. Am I correct? Is it? Are you guys using Roll20? Yeah. Um, it is an online tabletop convention, which means it has no uh, physical location. Uh, the two virtual tabletops we're using are Rule 20 and Inferno. Um, both are free and browser-based, and we wanted to make sure that we removed as many barriers to participation as possible. And we found that by doing it in that way, we have removed the monetary barrier and the technological barrier. Um, new this year, uh, we're using any meeting for all of our panels, all of the live publisher Q&As, and all of the artists on Quaint, which is again also free and browser based. Great. So, can we talk about some of the exciting things that uh, you can expect to experience when you log on to Ethercon on uh, November 15th or that weekend? Um, let's go with Cur Curtis. You want to answer that? I knew you were coming. All right. Some of the fun things we got coming up at Ethercon, aside from uh, a vendor's hall that is significantly larger than last year, and the vendors are, are very interactive. Um, last year we had a few of them, not quite as, as outspoken as, as they wanted to be, so we've got opened up and set up question and answer panels for the vendors. You can come in, you can learn about their new products and what's going on, and then you can run a demo with them right after that to see what's going on. Uh, we've got swag uh, completely unparalleled previous as well. Uh, we we're handing out stuff from vendors like, uh, as an example, Adventure Week is giving out a one-month membership to everybody who shows up. Uh, we've got uh, wow. free handouts for the GMs, we've got free handouts for the players, we got, um, there's even, we even have one of the artists uh, is doing a free drawing for the, all the vendors. All the vendors that just signed up for the vendor hall have a chance of winning a free half-page illustration from it. And that's, uh, what was the, the artist? I don't have enough stuff in my head. Um, John Gibbons. That's John, John Gibbons, yeah. Yeah, John Gibbons out of the UK. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's really something else. Uh, we are trying to, to break away from just a gaming convention. You get around and you get play games, which we all love. Don't get us wrong. But we've got uh, Tracy Hickman coming and showing off his new board game. Great. We've got Paizo running an insanely large event. Um, we're working with a few other vendors that haven't you know, officially confirmed yet, so I'm not going to reveal names, but we're trying to get a lot of uh, industry backing, so this feels a lot more like a physical convention, where you've got, uh, you know, vendors, you've got tables, you've got all sorts of fun stuff, uh, free gifts, you know, swag, as I mentioned, and uh, we've got just a lot going on, so we're, we're trying to make it more like a physical convention, even though it's in cyberspace, than uh, just a get around to gaming. That's a great, and, and the whole concept behind this uh, online you know, gaming convention is, is awesome because I have a lot of family members that love to game and friends and you know you get separated by space as you move on with your life you move away or it just can't get out to these big conventions like Gen Con or or um, 
<clears throat> so being able to log on and just jump into a convention, the whole idea behind that is just it's great, and I'm I'm happy that, that it's you know moving forward. But uh, what would you say is your your biggest challenges in um, in, in putting this together? Mostly just uh, you know all the different communications involved, or Mark, you want to grab that? Yeah, it's definitely coordination does tend to be a bit of an issue. Uh, it's funny because in the age of the internet, we've got an unparalleled ability to communicate with other people, but that means that everybody is talking all at once. So it's a question of being able to be heard over the literal sea of voices out there. Uh, there are tools for that, but it's, you've got to juggle the email, you've got to juggle Facebook, you've got to juggle IMs, and it's, uh, it's a challenge, to say the least. Yeah, Mark uh, hit on something that, that kind of leads into your previous question about uh, the technology we're using, too. That's one of the reasons we went with any meeting, is to kind of control the... Uh, flow of communication from artists and vendors so that when somebody coughs, for example, uh, it doesn't interrupt the artist working or the vendor talking. So any meeting we found is very good that way because it gives better moderator controls. So we're addressing some of those concerns we've got as far as like, communication like Mark mentioned. Not only in emails, we're using Facebook uh, to communicate with a lot of different vendors and a lot of different artists and uh, panelists, etc but also we're looking at, at running the convention in a method very similar uh, to a physical convention so that you've got moderators, you've got um, the artists and the, the vendors and the you know, game designers all able to speak without it being a, a technological collision uh, of somebody just with a loud microphone and happens to cough at the wrong time. Like, like chat room stuff that you end up, it, it, it comes off less like a chat room, more like an actual convention. Yeah, exactly. Um, ideally, what would happen there um, is that the people who are in the quote-unquote audience, they would type in their questions on the any meeting um, chat module to the left, and then the host and, and the guest would be talking by the video voice. So it, it really it really cleans up the, the, the environment. It gives the host a lot more control of that environment, which is why we went with it, as, as Curtis mentioned. And that, and that brings me to uh, an interesting. I went to Gen Con this year and did some panels. And there's a Q and A usually, you know, after the or at some point during the panels. Uh, the any meeting software is going to allow people to ask questions in an organized manner. Yeah, they will. I mean, everyone who wants to ask a question will type that question into the chat module. Ah. And the host will, you know, obviously keep an eye on that chat module. And as those questions come up, you'll then relay them to the the guest. And the guests will then the folks expound on their question. That's great. That's great. And for people who don't know much about the Roll Twenty software and some of the other software that you guys will be using for the actual gameplay, uh, what are the interesting features about that software that will be uh, prominently displayed at uh, Ethercon? Um, we have we have a guy, another Mark Mark Stout, who's our our tech coordinator, and. From my experience, I like I like uh, Roll Twenty simply because it 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 allows for a lot more. But on the other hand, it you know it allows you know a lot of graphics and stuff like that. There there is a lot of stuff there you can use. Um, it has dice macros, for example, which are great. Um, on the other hand, Inferno uh, does not have as as steep a learning curve. And it's more or less, it's, it's like a whiteboard you can move tokens around on. And uh, for someone who just, you know, wants to take a small step before taking a big step, mm. Inferno is, is, a, is a good place to start. You know, we're trying to get new people into online gaming. And so we have to, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Great, great. That sounds awesome. So, so you're saying that there'll be um, there'll be not just role playing games at this convention. There'll be other types of games. Uh, Tracy Hickman, for example, is actually running a board game. Oh wow! That he's running on uh, uh, virtually, and I imagine he's going to use Roll Twenty for it. Uh, just from conversations I've had with Tracy, but he's got a new one he just kickstarted called so Sojourner Tales, and it's actually a board game that ties in with a uh, electronic device. It's like a, a Kindle, for example. <laughs> So you roll the dice, you walk around the board, you draw cards from time to time, and you click buttons on an electronic device like his Kindle, as I said, 
and it changes what's going on in the game. And so he's really excited to, uh, Tracy and Laura, I talked to him at uh, Comic-Con here in Salt Lake City, are both very excited about having an, an online convention. They think it's kind of the direction you know, of the future as it were. They're really uh, techno-savvy compared to, to a lot of people who've been in the industry as long as they have. And me. <laughs> yeah, Steven has a hard time activating his microphone as you can <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, um, <clears throat> when you talk about swag, uh, are you talking about PDFs or is it, or, or electronic um, stuff? I mean, what kind of? I mean, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, Mark, you want to grab that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. These are and it's something of a barrier still amazingly enough to overcome in gaming that when you give out something like a PDF uh, people think of it as a virtual product that's a real product uh, I for example when I work in the game industry as a writer um, most of the stuff that I've done uh, with a very few exceptions has been in PDF uh, so that's another challenge to overcome but at the same time it allows EtherCon to actually give out more swag in terms of just the sheer variety and volume of stuff that people just get for free huh. or as prizes uh, that you would get at a physical convention because you've got that electronic portability there. Right. Well, electronic, um, the PDFs are, are huge now because of the tablets and, you know, our, uh, drive through RPG and some of these companies that have really monetized uh, the whole PDF you know, revolution as it is. Of gaming. Yeah. One thing that's uh, actually important there is not all the prizes are actually PDFs either. Um, Alyssa Patton, for example, is sending out physical copies of a lot of products. She's mailing it herself. Wow. Alyssa's, yeah. Yeah. Well, Alyssa's a fun girl. She's a groovy cat. Um, her for the uh, excuse me uh, for the uh, convention program uh, packet. She's actually sending out a. Uh, one copy of uh, Torn World, um, and which has, if I'm not mistaken, 36 different miniatures designed by, uh, oh, what's his name, um, Weiss, or well, what's his first name? Um, geez, I have to look it up now. <laughs> um, he does Cargo Cult. Uh, he's pretty much worked with everybody in the industry. He's uh, almost legendary. Now I can't think of his name. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, but uh, I think it's Jacob Weiss. Does that, does that sound great right to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob. It is Jacob. I believe so. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah, boy. What a what a great show note. You know, yeah, <laughs> great show note. Do it. Google search. Yeah. <laughs> Wiki is your friend. Absolutely. Yeah. Huh? Another uh, good example of that is Obatron is actually sending out print versions as well of a lot of their stuff. Um, but only in North America. Yeah, if it's in North America, otherwise the uh, caught ship. Yeah, Sid, you're infecting me. <laughs> it's a little too high, so they'll provide PDFs if it's outside. So you got vendors who have that kind of option as well, and that's something that uh, we're really looking forward to. Well, the great thing for vendors is that the availability of, you know, just like it's hard for people to get out to convention sometimes, it's hard for get vendors to get their word out on their products to people without, you know, without spending a ton of money traveling to these conventions. And, you know, the online convention allows for their voices to be heard in a, you know, in a, and they can concentrate more on what the message is than just getting across the country. Yeah, we've actually had a, one thing that we're really excited about uh, in, that, in regards to that is most of our vendors are not what you call uh, big AA Class A vendors. Okay, we do have Paizo, we do have Catalyst, uh, we do have a, a lot of really big guys there, don't get me wrong, but you get some smaller companies. Um, I work with Adventure a week, for example, they've been able to, to bounce around a little bit, they were at Gen Con, for example, but they really don't have the budget to travel a lot. So you get it online, you get it free, you get it everything that the little guy needs to get their product in the hands of their you know, potential consumers, it is just beautiful for them. And so we've had a lot of the, the little guys jump on board saying, oh, please, let me join. And it's been been wonderful. We've got, uh, how many vendors are we up to, Stephen? Like 20, uh, 25? Yeah, we're, 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 in the, we're in the 20s. <coughs> that, 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 that I know. Yeah, and last year, at the time of the convention last year, we had, you said, 15? Yeah, something, 15 or 16. Yeah. So, we, so we've definitely gone up. Yeah, and we're as I said, we're still working with a couple of the big, big guys, class A's and class B's, 
who aren't sure if they had the time to do it right now. Uh, we have had a few that had to back out. You know, it, you just uh, we got, already had other commitments. I'm sorry, and that happens. You know, but we're getting a lot more eager to, to hop on board than we have in the past. I do have to make a, a correction. It is Jason White Carver. Ah, not Jacob. Very close. Jason. Two letters off. Yes. <laughs> Depending on how you spell it, either one of them, you might even be closer to that. Free online swag. Okay, one of our chat listeners uh, has a question for you guys from Stana. It says, um, apparently there's one, there's a another online gaming convention that's skewed towards women, uh, electronic convention. Um, what setting? What is going to set Aethercon apart from other potential competitors, or do you feel as if you're the forefront of what is a new game, a new wave of gaming? make no claim to, you know, being the gaming convention. I mean, that's never why we got into this to begin with. We were never meant to be uh, Money Mountain. We were never meant to be Stairway to the Stars or anything like that. We just want to bring people together. And that's been our overarching purpose for doing this. And we're more than happy to work with anyone who wants to work with us. It happened in the summer. Uh, the women's gaming convention that was put on by women, by women. Um, but we happen to work with anybody. We're really firm in, in our belief that the genre needs to work together uh, as a, a whole rather than be divisive. So we're not trying to, to be the better than X or the only solution for Y. That's not really what we're in this for. Our hope is to get together and run a, a convention beyond just you know sitting down having games like we talked about but involving vendors, involving question and answer panels, involving product reviews, involving everything you get at a live physical convention without having to travel. Uh, in many cases, you, know, you can be in your slippers and pajamas for all the care. Keep it decent if you're on a webcam. But you, you know, <laughs> that's our goal. Our goal is to make it so anybody can show up. Anybody can be there. And they'll have the same experience they have at a real convention without the lines, the hats, and the crowds, and the weird people wearing spandex. <laughs> as far as you know. So you can wear spandex at home if you wish. Okay. Uh, more power to you. Right, before we started recording and started this podcast, you guys were talking a little bit about how clicky gamers can get. And um, I know that it has a little bit to do with, you know, the organization and, you know, get, there's, I'm sure it's difficult to, you know, to organize all these, what you, you know, so-called clicks. Um, you think uh, AetherCon is going to help in bringing everybody together? And Mark, you want to grab that? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's one of the great things, despite all the challenges, that is one of the great things about having an online convention, about bringing people together that can't physically travel or don't have the cash to physically travel to a convention. Uh, and you'll hear a lot of people, and I, I can speak from experience, some of it's true, um, that say that the lack of identity and accountability online tends to bring out the worst in folks. And to an extent, that's true. Uh, I was the primary forum administrator for Electronic Arts for three years running, and I like to tell people I have seen things that popped up on there that would turn their hair white. Hmm. But at the same time, 
I honestly think that the kind of environment that we're providing at EtherCon, and for that matter, all the other virtual conventions, because it, it really is a community. We're trying to bring people together, not just for gaming, but for that sense of community, to get people exposed to new ideas, to get them talking about gaming, talking about the kind of culture that we get, and especially talking about the community. And so, do you think there will be a need to, to I don't know, moderate people's behavior in, the, in this type of situation, given the fact that sometimes people lose control of themselves online? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, moderation is important, uh, but just as important is to make that moderation as transparent and unintrusive as possible. There, there's always going to be somebody that wants to spoil things simply for the hellacious joy of spoiling it. But again, speaking from experience, being a person that on, moderated online communities, mm -hmm. those people are really the minority. They really are. And everybody else simply wants to do their thing. They want to have fun. They want to enjoy themselves. And that's what we're trying to facilitate. Well, one thing Mark uh, touched on, and actually relates back to the, you know, uh, the clicks and, and getting everything in and friendly together. Uh, I was actually sitting down with a a local gaming store after Comic Con a couple weeks ago, and we talked about uh, the barrier to entry uh, in a lot of different ways. You've got, you know, if you want a new game, you got to buy a uh, book for it. There's 50 bucks. Or you're gonna like it or not. You got to find local gamers, which is getting very, very hard, like we discussed earlier. Yeah. And so, a situation where you've got an online convention like this, you already have somebody who has the books, or a couple uh, different games are really starting to, to put out their main core rule books. Uh, for free or dirt cheap or PDF format, right. so that barriers dropped a lot. And so now you can say, okay, I've always wanted to play X. If I find a game to play it, I can at least see if I like it, and I'm not out sixty bucks and calling you know my third cousin to see if he wants to play. So there's a lot of things there that they also can come together to help break down those barriers. You know, if you haven't played. Uh, I'll pick on Pathfinder 4th Edition. That's a, a good argument. They've, uh, you like one or you like the other. And I'm not going to say which one I prefer. That They've already mentioned it, but that's not the point. Um, you've got the, the, a different set, and they're very different rules and very different fields. But now instead of buying $100 worth of 4th Edition books, or you know, $50 for a Pathfinder book, you can sit down and test it and see which one you really like before you really get started. And you already have a gaming group. You know, we're hoping that these uh, friendships, you know, when you meet around a game, you have the GM is say six players, those seven people, we're hoping at least a couple of them keep in touch and game over the, the long haul. I've got uh, on my Skype list three or four gamers uh, that I played uh, a zombie game with uh, last day for coming still. Huh. You know, there's, there's that potential to build the industry and involve people year round as well. Well, that's great. It's an interesting strategy to go about it that way. Find the game group first, then find the game. Because I, I, I'm, I'm known to be a game killer. Whenever I start playing a game, that's exactly when it goes out of play or it gets killed. My favorite games all die as soon as I start to love them. It's kind of a curse. Well, I was uh, giving Steven some stories about why I'm a GM rather than a player. So I, I hear you. I, I tend to break games apart unintentionally, yeah. play my character... But my method of playing characters like a pacifist priest. Let's face it, nobody wants to play D&D. <laughs> yeah. So, that, yeah. that game, yeah, that party lasted a week. But <laughs> that's funny because uh, we have a we have a web series called Game Nights. It's over at criticalhitmedia.com, and one of the characters it's a half animated, half live action where the characters will voice their animated characters as we cut back and forth like ADD style. And one of the characters is exactly that. He's like in real life, he's a hippie, and his animated character is a, a cleric pacifist. But honestly, though, I mean, that, it, it's on, I mean, it's hard to parody sometimes. These games get so... I knew a friend who, who basically didn't want to roleplay because he was more into the combat, so he just made his character mute. I yeah. have had... I speak gross sign language. <laughs> I have had a character who, whose nickname was actually mute. He spoke seldom, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's... I don't know. I've always enjoyed voicing my character. Um, and I, I actually, I actually work, I actually work hard actually to get a good voice for my characters when I'm in a game, and I find that to be one of the more enjoyable aspects of gaming. And because 
of, of where I am, there's not a whole lot of local quote-unquote talent to game with. So I'm really thankful that I've got the option of gaming online and I can do this thing I've always liked to do. And I and I don't, you know, I'm not smothered by the fact that there's nothing here to do, you know, there's no one here to do it with. Well, that's an interesting point you bring up. By, by doing online gaming, especially online role-playing, you... Um you can really, you can really imagine the person. You can get, you know, because you have that on an anonymity in a sense. It can, your, you know, the, your imagination can go further as to, you know, who these people are. You know, you can definitely dive in there. Or you can, you can uh, keep that shield, for like the, the shield of anonymity, if you need to, or you can reveal it a little bit of time. Uh, primary example, okay, I play uh, MechWarrior Online, and I'm in a, a very, very, very large unit. Uh, they were looking for somebody to run games. This is dated almost a year ago now. Uh, somebody to run some games for them. You know, I've, I've been GMing for 20, 30, oh God, years. Wow. Uh, so I, I volunteered. <laughs> yeah, back when we were playing on Papyrus. <laughs> <laughs> the dice were made of the dice were made of bones. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, we bring back ancient memories. But uh, so I said, okay, fine. You know, I'll, I'll GM because nobody could find a player. Play a group nearby. Nobody. Okay. So from that one game, and I've, I've told this story a million times, but from that one group, and okay, we formed a, a Wednesday Pathfinder game, which is kicking back in. We took a break over the summer. Our Wednesday GMT Pathfinder game. I actually played with a bunch of Europeans. We have a, a German with an axe. He's very scary. <laughs> uh, we have our Tuesday Back Warrior game. We had a Sunday Shadowrun game, uh, which you know I, I kind of backed up on that one because it was the only day I actually saw my wife. <laughs> So I, I kind of figured, you know, family life is important. But, uh, you know, from all this, this group saying, we wish we could find a group to play with. And there we go. Now, some of them are uh, still fairly anon you know, anonymous to me. I don't know them very well. Others, like uh, Laura, you know, we started chatting with. Laura lives, yeah, well, I think I figured out 2,500 miles from me. But we, we chit-chat a lot now. Uh, I know that she was in San Francisco for a convention this weekend. I know that... Uh, yeah, she'll be back running a demo of uh, the tournament actually tomorrow for me. So you know, we're that uh, shield's gone down a little bit. So we're sharing stories, we're sharing events, and that's very similar to what happened when uh, I started playing EverQuest. I got friends in Rhode Island I've never met. I've got friends in New York I've never met. I got you know I know what's going on with their kids. I know what their favorite color is. One of them's dying their hair purple. <laughs> <laughs> that's more than I know about my neighbor. I don't even want to know my neighbors. <laughs> you know, last week I met uh, somebody I met in EverQuest. Uh, if you follow D&D for a while, you recognize the name. Yeah. And this is the first time I've actually met him. I've known him for 15 years. I met him last week. <laughs> you knew his character better than you knew him. That's great. Well, you get to know his... And I always thought that it's interesting... The characters, people, like when you play, especially in a role-playing game with somebody you don't know, you sort of get to know them from a different angle because they're playing a character. And that, the psychology of role-playing has always been the most fascinating part for me. Uh, if you can be anybody you, you know, anybody else, who would you choose to be and why? And so... Well, uh, cool. I guess I could tell you the way that I got into RPG because that's actually a fairly illustrated story, and I, I promise it won't be one of my hour and a half long ones. Uh, my father was a drug abuse counselor in an inpatient facility down in San Antonio here in Texas, wow. and I, I, he had an apartment on site. I wandered around the facility a lot, which maybe was not the smartest thing to do sometimes. Uh, but I wandered across a group of fellows playing, and I don't know if anybody else remembers this, just to kind of give away. Uh, the old pace setter version of Chill, the horror. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And I owned RPGs. I had I had d and I had the old Boulder Bay stuff. I had Star Frontiers. I had Gamma World. But uh, living in the barrio in San Antonio, it's not exactly uh, a great environment to run into people to play it. And at the age of nine, nobody's going to take you seriously. But I wandered over and I started talking to these guys. They're all, they're all ex-convicts. Uh, basically out on probation trying to get their lives together and they're playing this RPG and I'm like, are, are you guys playing? And I ended up becoming basically the unofficial mascot of the group, which was fantastic. Uh, they they taught me a lot. And these were guys, like I said, that were trying to get their lives back together that really 
saw RPGs as a way, as a doorway to be somebody different. Yep. And it and uh, they they all turned out pretty well. One of them ended up becoming, uh, and this is this is kind of funny. One of them ended up becoming the director of the facility a few years down. So I I uh. absolutely hear you on the assumption of another role of being another person in RPG. That's that's one of my favorite things. Absolutely, and that's interesting. Um, that uh, yeah, role playing has been used for years in therapy, so it's really nothing new in that sense. Um, it's we a great way of uh, opening up and showing you some potential, or uh, you can look at it a little bit on the other side, and you know how bad you can can get if you don't change your way, sort of thing. So there's a lot, a lot there, or work through situations. They've used it in business management. They used it in therapy, like you said. So it, it's not new, you know, not by any stretch. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another question. Do you think that the um, the economy and the state of the economy is going to help drive the attendance at uh, AetherCon? Um, for us, the fact, I mean, like I said, we're trying to lower a lot of barriers for folks to uh, come to our event, and one of those barriers was a monetary barrier. Um, therefore, uh, AetherCon is free to attend. Um, there are no uh, games you don't have to pay to enter a game. Uh, the only thing you would end up paying for would be if you, you know, if you want to buy something from one of the vendors or if you want to commission something from one of the artists. Okay. Um, the artists themselves, though, they're all putting up uh, free downloadable wallpapers, which are really wow. great. They've got some really good ones out there right now. Um, but what you know, there, there, there's a, there's a, a large. Uh, point to be made here, and that is just strictly from an economic point of view, um, folks, you know, we, we, we need to, to band together, I mean, we, we've gone over this theme before, because, you know, there's not, a, I mean, if you look at where the entertainment dollar goes, not a lot of it comes uh, towards uh, tabletop role-playing games, so um, if we're all divided, uh, that's just that's just one more barrier for someone who wants to get into it to overcome. You know, so that's I mean, yeah, I mean the economy plays a big role both in our event and and in role playing games in general. Yeah, there's a big boom in the comic book world because of the comic book movies, but I think role playing games and, and this kind of uh, and uh, <clears throat> entertainment doesn't get the the attention it deserves, in my opinion, as well. So just to just to put it out there. A E T H E R C O N dot com. Check it out. Ethercon. Ethercon dot com. November fifteenth. Ethercon. Just to make sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll take it anywhere we can get it. You can call it anything you want. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, free to attend. And uh, it's the cutting edge of role playing, if you ask me. And that was part one of our sizzling interview with the Ethercon people. Check them out at Ethercon dot com. Check us out at criticalhitmedia.com. dot com. And like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash gamers of comedy.